the next 20 years will look nothing like the last 20 years. This is a gorgeous opportunity to change the world. But we had a good reason. 
Worldwide caviar production was down by 95%. You know, we had overfished the Caspian Sea. But when we called New York City Michelin star restaurants and asked why caviar wasn't on their menu, they said it's because we couldn't get the stuff. And then they said, do you have the stuff? And I knew that if I could produce this product, I would have a capital market. So we did what MB, every MBA student was told to do. We wrote a business plan. We spent $20,000 and 20 flights later, we had visited every fish farm in North America. We put that into an 80-page business plan and a 10 tab Excel model and had a perfect business we started pitching it at the business plan competitions, and I still remember winning my first fifteen thousand dollars. Were we ever excited? You know, that was money was just mine to go start this business. Three months later, we had done it five more times. We had raised our first one hundred and twenty thousand dollars without giving up any equity. But I had a bigger problem here. I was pitching that I needed six million dollars to start a fish farm. <laughs> so you know, this is kind of my job in the bucket. And let's be real here: we were three. 22-year-olds asking for $6 million to start a fish farm when we had never made or sold caviar. So what was my solution? It was time to get scrappy once again. I used to figure out how to make and sell caviar and I needed to figure out how to do it. In the wild, it takes 10 to 25 years for a fish to mature. I have two months. <laughs> So I had two months. I figured out that there was a wild supply of surgery in New Brunswick and that she could legally fish it there. So I remember hopping into Ryan's Toyota Camry, taking our winnings, and driving to the East Coast. Absolutely a real story. <laughs> we got there and we needed a fishing license. Fisheries Canada told us they were no longer issuing sturgeon fishing licenses. And in fact, there was only five people left in the entire eastern seaboard with the sturgeon fishing license. And they all were between the ages of 75 and 95. <laughs> this, this was an old bunch. So I convinced the lady at Fisheries to give me this list of names, but they certainly didn't have phone numbers. And so I remember grabbing a phone book and calling every Elmer Dixon in the phone book. I found another guy, and I was getting ready for my big negotiation. I was willing to pay $5,000 a week to register the commission license because I knew that every fish was worth between five and ten thousand dollars. So and I'm gearing up and I'm saying, you know, Elmer, what, what do you want for this fishing license? And Elmer goes, honey, for you, two hundred and fifty dollars for the summer. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Elmer, we got a deal. <laughs> so off he went. After I had a license, I then needed a fisherman to support Elmer at seventy-five. Was not catching fish. And then we found the first fisherman, and I remember it was eight days, and every day I called him, and I was like, Thane, you know, do you have a fisherman? The guy's name was Thane Jones, great Eastern Coast name. And he said, he said, no, when he said, Michelle, I just, I just don't feel like killing fish anymore. <laughs> and in my brain I said, by definition, a fisherman is a fish killer. <laughs> now I have a fisherman with an existential crisis on my head. Well, in the Canadian Listeria crisis was happening. <laughs> Could my luck get any worse? But you know what? After eight weeks of getting up at 5 a.m. and spending 16 hours a day in rain, I'm telling you, they didn't look anything like this. We had shipped thousands of pounds of fish across the country. We had sold to the top 100 restaurants in Canada, and we had created more demand than we could have ever imagined in our two-month pilot project. So there it was. It was back. I still needed to solve my initial problem. Now I was asking for six million dollars for a fish farm, but I had a proven and profitable business model. You know, this should be a lot easier. Except the problem this time is that I was asking for this for one of the most superfluous luxury products in the world at a time where the largest recession since the 1930s had just fit. Yeah. I mean, this was a very good time. And so here, I learned that we got a really far by being scrapped. You know, just kind of fighting it out and figuring out all these details along the way. 
but it brought me to my second conclusion, which is that instead of doing all this planning, we should have just been executing. That I had spent eight months building a business plan when I knew in two, after a two month pilot project, if this business was possible or not. So that was more important. It was way more important to execute than to ever plan, and no amount of planning in the world can prevent you from failure. So when we started Bytopia.ca, we did everything differently. I mean, I'm not even about everything. No three-month process of what's the next million dollar idea. No eight-month process of building a business plan. We decided in 24 hours we were going to launch a daily deal site. We would launch the trade show, and we would get one famous person to tweet for us. That was it. That was the entire business plan. <laughs> That's all we had. So what happened? Well, we went to go launch this trade show, and the outsourced website didn't work. So when we launched our website, it was actually one JPEG image with one button that worked. The button. <laughs> and then we got the famous person to tweet, but that didn't do very much. And frankly, our Twitter following is still pretty pathetic. But anyway, but we had made three thousand dollars in our first trade show and ten thousand dollars in our first day of sales. And here's where I realized. That, you know, it was just a good execution, and that's all we needed to do. So, you know, this brings me to my third point. That as you're executing, you get very scared. And every day I still get scared. I was still scared to take the job. It was very scary to do my job and to just, you know, jump into starting this business. I'm always scared of competitors. You should never be afraid of competitors. When there's competitors in a space, it means that you're probably solving an important problem, and then there's money to be made there. You know, we entered the group buying space two years late, and I feel like there's a new competitor every single week. But as long as I'm building a profitable business, as long as we have merchants that still want to run with us, and as long as consumers are not buying, I just have to ignore that. The second thing that you shouldn't be afraid of is going after big fish. We cold called one of the largest media companies in Canada before we even had a website and told them why they used to be in a group line space. And it was one of those little projects and one of those little cold calls that led to a great pilot project with them. The other thing I used to think is that this fear of scared would go away, and it never did. I used to think that when we got to half a million dollars of revenue, I wouldn't be scared anymore. When we got to a million dollars of revenue, I wouldn't be scared anymore. And three, and the next milestone, and the next one. But it never goes away. I always feel scared. You know, you just upgrade your problem. Ten months ago, my biggest problem is that I had no revenue. And I that was a very big problem. <laughs> and today, my largest problem is I can't hire people fast enough to keep up with that revenue growth. Today, my is one of the ten largest daily deal sites in Canada. <laughs> we introduced the concept to big businesses that have even said no to living social and more than anything, ironically, we started by Tokyo with the remaining $15,000 that was left in our Edmondale Caviar bank account. So, I mean, this wasn't easy. We've had lots of sleepless nights, and sure have we made a lot of mistakes. We wasted a month in our third month of operation evaluating three different financing options. So instead of just growing our business, we tried to shoot which was that we almost lost your business because of it. You know, we hired a few bad eggs along the way. But when, you know, a large media house says, yeah, let's do a pilot project with you guys. Or when you make $400,000 in a sale in five days for the company that your competition bought you would never get. Or when you bring on brands like Soup de Soleil that even your parents admire, you know you've gone from taking your little experiment and building that into a real business. So my last piece of off the cuff advice for aspiring entrepreneurs is make sure you have a revenue model. Just like a human, humans need money to live. And without money, they usually die. And this is the same with business. I hear from tons of entrepreneurs that have great ideas of doing something cool on the internet, but no idea of what their revenue model is going to be. I'm telling you now, without a revenue model, your business will die. And more importantly, after three months of not sleeping, you will also die. <laughs> Find or produce something for $5 and sell it for 10 
But always remember that profitable businesses can almost always be sold. But great ideas, sometimes not. So I mean, you know, this probably sounds like it was a lot of work. And you might look at me and say, oh my god, she looks like she's 35 and she's only 26. <laughs> and you know, as someone who was really involved in charity, I think I almost hesitated diving feet first into a capitalist convention. But I can't tell you today how rewarding this is. You know, how great it is to build a team and how the team even tell you sometimes that they like working and that they're growing. This is incredibly rewarding, and although I'm not directly saving the world every day, I feel like I'm giving back more than I ever have before. So, <clears throat> the real question. Was it all worth it? You know, I think entrepreneurship is always worth it because it's the only career that allows you to skip a lot. It doesn't tell you you need this many years to do this or this many years to do this. It actually just rewards merit. You know, I never guessed that I would have some of the adventures I the ex-CEO of Estee Lauder emailed my Gmail account at one point asking to invest in one of my businesses. We had Warren Buffett eat our caviar at one point. I mean, I didn't even think that he liked the stuff. And I've now had people walk into my office asking to take a company I own public. I mean, like these stories are just better than fiction. I can't make stuff like that up. And frankly, it's not only me. Like you saw it with yourself. Haley spent the day with Richard Branson. And could now just stop back from like eight countries in the last three weeks. So that's the power of entrepreneurship. So everyone gives you the laws of business, you know, and has certain rules. When we started by like, telling our competitive advantages that we had one fancy or a videographer. And after four days, it wasn't much of a competitive advantage anymore. So sometimes it's not about that, it's about the execution. It's about better sales, better negotiation, building a better team. <laughs> So, you know, in conclusion, you've got to be willing to get scrappy. You've got to stop planning and start going. And you can't be afraid of your competitors. So if I was at dinner with myself, I would have said, Michelle, let's forget dessert. Let's get up and get going. <laughs>